While bodies were being found for years, the Ohio investigators didn't see this monster roaming until a 911 call came in. When a woman began to whisper that she had been abducted and her abductor was sleeping next to her, the rescue mission began. But what investigators didn't expect was that this house of horrors contained hidden bodies, and this survivor may have escaped a man who had done this many times before. An unknown serial killer whose confessions would just keep coming. You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I am Brooke McKenna and I am so grateful that you are here. Make sure you are signed up for the Genuine Gem newsletter. YouTube doesn't always like to notify you when uploads are going up and so I highly recommend to just sign up for that to make sure you are getting notifications. But now it's time for today's Genuine Gem shout out. So Possum Frog would like to shout out the case of Kate Brown and Carnell Sledge who were murdered in 2019 at a local park. It is still unsolved today. If you would like to be the next genuine gem in the next video, go ahead and leave a case down below or an organization that you would like to feature. Now, while I've seen this case we're about to dive into covered, I've never seen information about the female detective in this case and how much she really had to do with the capture of the serial killer and the confessions that he would make. And so I actually found her book. She's Detective Kim Major and, and she would be face to face with this killer for hours. This man was not handcuffed during this interrogation and she would find out that he was secretly planning to kill her as well. I will link her book down below. It's called A Hunger to Kill and it is so incredibly interesting the amount of interrogation methods that she went through and what she used to essentially catch a serial killer and allow him to trust her in a way that he was apologizing to her when he would lie. But before we get into the story, a quick message from our sponsor, Helix. The Helix Black Friday sale is live now. Visit helixsleep.com slash Brooke McKenna to get 25% off your mattress plus two free pillows and receive a free bedding bundle with your Lux or Elite order. Sleep is such a priority to me and it should be to you too. Sleep quality is so important to manage health and stress. And when we moved into this new place, I knew I wanted to get a higher quality mattress and I've never felt such a difference in comfort than with the Helix mattress. So Helix delivers customizable mattresses based on your sleep quiz, which analyzes your body type and sleep preferences, and then it ships straight to your door. Now I prefer a medium firmness, so I was matched with the Midnight mattress, and I love it. And I didn't have to struggle to find a way to transport this bulky new mattress home and into place, because with Helix, it's shipped straight to your door, and then it's also rolled up for very easy transport into exactly where you want it in your home, for easy setup. What's special about Helix though is their 100 night sleep trial. This is longer than most companies out there to make sure it's really up to your standards. And you can also get flexible payments or financing options and the 10 year warranty for the mattress as well. So this household has been loving the Helix mattress. In fact, my boyfriend came home the other night and was like, I'm so ready to get into bed because he had such a good sleep the night before on this mattress. One of the things that I really love about it is the fact that it has a cooling mattress topper. So this section up here not only adds some volume to it, but it also has a cooling touch, which is perfect for me because I sleep so hot and I have noticed such a difference already in this bed and the way that I'm sleeping. So like I said, I got the Helix Midnight, but on Helix, there are so many different types of mattresses that you can choose from. There are elite mattresses, there are mattresses for tall sleepers, mattresses for kids. The Helix Black Friday sale is live now. Visit helixsleep.com slash Brooke McKenna to get 25% off your mattress plus two free pillows and receive a free bedding bundle with your Lux or Elite order. Now let's get back to the story. So it starts in 2005 in Marion County, Ohio, when a woman would be found deceased. She was discovered in a field along Victory Road. However, she would quickly become a Jane Doe. Investigators were unable to identify this woman and it seemed like they never would. They couldn't have known then 
that a serial killer was just getting started. Then 10 years later in February of 2015 in Mansfield, Ohio, which was about an hour from that Jane Doe and where she was found, a 31 year old named Rebecca Lacey was reported missing. The next month on March 16th, her body would be found in Ashland County by an employee of the Columbia Gas Transmission. He was checking on the gas wells in the area when he found a body and this body was actually propped up against the trunk of a majestic oak tree. Her body was strangely well preserved and her features on her face especially were still recognizable. As the Ashland County Coroner's Office completed her autopsy, they believed that she had been deceased for almost two months. And when they identified her as Rebecca Lacey, they realized that this meant that she had died soon after vanishing. However, like I said, this was strange due to her well-preserved body because decomposition in most cases would have already set in. But Rebecca's death didn't appear to be foul play to the coroner. Coroner Dale Tommy ruled that this death was an overdose and her family was not shocked by this, nor did they fight this cause of death because they knew that she was in a bad crowd around this time. They knew that she was an addict. And so they figured that this is something that could have happened to her, but she did leave three children behind. This wasn't of any concern to investigators who didn't believe that there was a danger to their community if this was just simply an overdose. So investigators would not be able to piece together the slow beginning of a serial killer in their area until the kidnappings and the killings would begin to ramp up. One woman would be the catapult to putting a monster behind bars. It was 2016 in Ashland, Ohio, about 23 minutes from where Rebecca Lacey was found, and Ashland police received a call to 911 around 6.48 in the morning. This was on September 13th, 2016, and a woman speaking in a very hushed tone would tell the dispatcher that she had been abducted. When she was asked the address of her location, she said that it was across the street from the 4th Street laundromat. She pleaded with the dispatcher to listen to her, even telling her the name of her abductor. 911, what is the address to your emergency? By the Fourth Street Laundromat. What is it? Fourth, Fourth Street Laundromat. What's the problem? I've been abducted. What's your name? How do you spell your last name? Who abducted you? Sean Green. Is it John Green? Sean, great. Where's she at now? Asleep. Where's she sleeping at? In the bedroom. In what bedroom? There's two houses right by the laundry street. And it's in one of those houses. But you're at the laundry mat? No, I'm, I'm in the bedroom with them. If you're looking in the laundry mat, it's the one on the left. Of the two. You don't know what color the house is? No. Please hurry. Does he have a car? No. Okay, does he own the house? No, he broke into it. Does anybody actually live there? I think they've been abandoned. Does he have a weapon? He's got a taser. What does he look like? Is he a white male or black male? Is he like six foot or is he shorter than that? He's like six one, six two. Do you know how much he weighs? Probably one seventy five. Are you injured? A little. What color is his hair? Brown. Where did he take you from? My my apartment. I mean, I was walking with him. I, I've known him for like a month and a half. Is there any way you can get out of the building? I don't know without waking him, and I'm scared. Okay, is there a bathroom in the, the house? Well, his bedroom is closed, and he made it so it would make noise. But if you told him you had to go to the bathroom, he would do something to you? Yeah, because he had me tied up. So are you tied up now? Well, I... Yeah, but I kind of freed myself. Are they on the way? Yeah, we have officers we're sending. Okay. Please send them up. Okay, if, you, if you're worried, you don't have to talk. You can just set the phone down, okay? As the dispatcher prodded for more information, she was answering, but she spoke so quietly it was barely audible. She begged the dispatcher to make sure to send enough 
police. Do you know where he lives? Just shut the phone down. See if they can come in the side door. Is there a padlock on the bedroom door, or is it just a regular lock? No, I don't even. I don't even know if it's locked. It's not knob, so. Can you get up and see if you can get out? Is there a window around there you can look out? Yeah, but the floor squeaks and it's right by his head. Are you laying down? No, I'm standing right by the bedroom door. And you can't open it? I'm afraid without making noise. Is the door to the house open? I don't know. Probably. Maybe. I don't think he has a key. I'm not sure. Because I think he broke in here. Can you see out any window that you're at? They're all, um, they're all curtains shut. And after this woman locked in this man's home, had answered every possible question she could to get the police there, the dispatcher informed her that help was on the way. As she heard that, she finally allowed herself to break down and cry, but she suddenly stopped saying that she was afraid that she had just woken up her abductor. Now, as the dispatcher tried to push her to get out of the room that she was in, she claimed that he would hear her, he would catch her, and that he was strong. If you think you can get out, you need to get out. Unless they were right here. He would hear me catch me and he's strong. Okay, I think I hear him. You hear him? Yes, I do. Okay, do you think you can get out? Yeah. Can you hear anybody right now? Out of the You're out? Okay, can you get to the door where you can see out? When the woman on the phone, the abducted woman, heard the police outside, she instructed them on exactly how to get inside the door that did not have a doorknob. This was in the room in the house. But she ended up summoning the strength herself to get out of that bedroom without being heard by her abductor and got to the side door on the house that led to the outside. This door was locked. And so she told dispatch that she could see the officers, but they were headed away from her and they actually needed to come back to help her. Is there a window there? Yeah, I'm looking out and they tell them to come back. She said, hurry, hurry. She said to hurry up and come back. So she unlocked the door and finally officers opened the door and told the woman to get out of the house. They were met with a nude, terrified woman. You could hear on this 911 call as the officers entered the residence and made this way over to this abductor. It took 19 minutes to locate the abductee. She was at an Ashland home on 363 Covert Court, which was across the street from a laundromat. Here, cover yourself up. Tell me what happened. Tell me what happened. What happened? Now, Detective Kurt Dorsey was one who had responded to this 911 call and they looked at the homes across the street from the laundromat and they found no signs of life in either. These were abandoned homes. There were no lights, there were no cars parked in the driveway, no sounds being made. They didn't know which home she could be located in or why she was in one of these homes at all. These two yellow houses were boarded up. They were vacant, at least everybody in the community believed so. But just as they were about to turn back, give up their search, that is when Detective Dorsey actually had an overwhelming feeling telling him to turn back. He was a Christian and he believed it was God sending him a message to save this woman. So he went to try to get to one of the rear doors of one of the homes and he found it locked and it was also up a bit higher. The stairs that would normally come out from this back door of this house didn't have any stairs or any sort of landing to get up there. So it was too high for him. So he ended up going to a storm door door on that house and he pulled it open. Now he was still able to keep very quiet doing this. However, he didn't hear anything or see anything once he pulled this door open. And just as he was about to turn away, that's when he heard dispatch saying, the woman inside just heard whatever you guys are doing, you are close. So Detective Dorsey then went back to that side door that he couldn't quite reach and he reached for the doorknob 
hoping that this survivor had unlocked it. And that is when he saw in the window next to it, a handprint pressed against the glass. It wasn't just a print, it was an actual hand of the woman like something out of a horror movie. Still not wanting to make any noise to wake the abductor and have this be a whole different situation, trying to get this woman out of the house. That is when Dorsey contacted dispatch and told them to have the woman unlock the door. And this is why the dispatcher was pushing her so hard to actually get out of the room and to try to save herself. Only moments later, this brave survivor would open the door to detectives and Dorsey was looking at this nude woman that had a restraint hanging from her arms. She was completely bruised on her arms, on her legs. Her eyes were filled with terror. Dorsey had found the survivor, but she was in complete and utter shock at this time. She was frozen. So as Dorsey motioned her to come out of the house, she couldn't move. And finally, after he was telling her that she was safe, she moved with him, but they actually put her in one of the bathrooms inside of the home due to the fact that she was nude as they went and looked for the abductor. She had told the detectives that he was in the bedroom sleeping. So Detective Dorsey and his colleagues, Lieutenant Schreffler and Sergeant Cox entered the home with their weapons drawn. As they entered this home, a very foul odor hit them. There were piles of dirty dishes with gnats covering them, but this did not seem like it was bad enough to have that smell emanating from it. This was something entirely different. But but they went through the hallway to the bedroom door. It was partially open, but there was something blocking it from fully opening on the inside. But Dorsey kicked the door open, and that is when they found the man lying on the bed. And on this bed, there were also pieces of women's clothing that were tied to the bed frame. They yelled at him to get up to show them his hands, and the man did as he was told, and Sergeant Cox actually handcuffed him behind his back. He was also nude, so that is when Dorsey handed him a pair of shorts and helped him put it on before escorting him outside into the back of the police car and down to the station. When the survivor was taken to the hospital for examination, she was found with multiple bruises and sexual orifice traumas, as well as vaginal bleeding. Her pubic hair had actually been shaved into a heart shape, and this was quickly removed by the sexual assault forensic examiner. But this survivor was rocking back and forth during the exam. She was terrified, and everyone knew this man was a monster. But it wouldn't be until they searched inside that residence where the survivor was rescued that they would realize just how many women this man had victimized. 38-year-old survivor who was purposely unidentified would be brought to the Ashland Police Department and Detective Kim Major, who was a female law enforcement officer, one of the only women on the force, would be sent by Captain David Lay to interview her, to speak with her. She actually spoke with a lot of sexual assault victims. She had training in that. And as she approached the survivor, Detective Major would see a woman who appeared to be in her 30s with dirty hair and bruises on her arms, legs, and face. It appeared as though she hadn't showered in days. She had redness on her neck and her torso, as well as swollen eyes that were bloodshot. As Detective Major took the survivor into her office, which was a much less formal environment for the questioning, the survivor suddenly said, are you going to stay with me? I don't want him to see me. And Detective Major reminded her that she was safe at the police department, but she wasn't quite sure. The survivor said that she was scared and that she was hurting. And then she asked, does Sean know where I am? Can he get access to me? When the detective was reassuring her that he would not get to her, the survivor began talking. But the first thing the survivor would mention was not about what she had gone through, this terrifying traumatic experience. This was the name of a missing woman but we'll get into that story in a little bit. But this survivor, who we will just be calling Survivor due to the fact that she would like to be anonymous, would tell the detective a bit about herself. She said she was on unemployment, but she did have some babysitting gigs for extra money. She loved to paint, read the Bible, and a lot of her life surrounded faith and her religious beliefs. She was learning Hebrew to study the Bible and its original language. She would even volunteer at the local Christian organizations, at the homeless shelters, and one thing that she often did was go to the Croc Center, which was in Ashland, which is where people in need would go, especially for free lunches and snacks during the summer. 
and this is where she had met her abductor for the first time. Now, she said her abductor had told her that he was working part-time at a discount supermarket, but had a lot of free time like she did, and so they bonded over this, and they decided to start hanging out. Now, the survivor claimed that she always thought of him as this goofy older brother. They talked about the Bible. They played tennis together. The survivor said that Although her abductor, who was just a friend and acquaintance at this point, tried to get her number and make moves on her, she didn't really want anything to do with it. She believed this relationship was platonic and refused to give him her number. She explained that she was saving herself for marriage and she was just very protective over that side of her life. She thought of him as very kind, but he would later tell the survivor that all of this sexual assault and kidnapping had happened to her because she didn't trust guys enough. She believed it was a challenge to him. The survivor would then inform police of how she had gotten into this house of horrors. She would recount her traumatizing experience that began on September 11th, which was actually three days prior to her rescue. So on September 11th, 2016, she had gone with this man, her new friend, to walk the Jameson Creek Trail. This was about five miles from her apartment. They loved to go on long walks on adventures and he had actually told her that he had made a fort in the woods that he wanted to show her. Now it took quite a while to get there but when they did the fort was there and the abductor said he had watched the 4th of July fireworks from that fort but he would also begin digging something up and that is when he would hand the survivor a box of gems. They then would head back into town. They stopped at a Dollar Tree where the survivor needed to get some cleaning supplies for her apartment. And they actually ran into one of the survivor's friends. So the survivor's friends gave them a ride back to her apartment. And from there, the survivor said that the abductor had mentioned that his mother and sister had actually given some clothes to him for her, some hand-me-down clothes, if she wanted to come over to his place and look through them. She agreed the abductor's mother had given her clothes before. It wasn't strange to her. She was very appreciative of this. She did not have much. So the survivor claimed when they got to his home, she went inside, which was not something she normally did. She normally stayed on his doorstep. She made him stay on her doorstep. They didn't enter each other's homes, but she said that day they were talking and she just kind of entered trying to get this bag of clothes. That's when she saw a trash bag of clothes on the bed and it was actually a bed that was in the living room but she thanked him and then asked if they could go back outside but he pulled up a chair placed it next to the bed and said that they could read the bible there so she started reading this bible he was following along next to her and then he got up and began to pace around the room when she asked what he was doing he pulled the bible out of her hands very aggressively and threw it to the side she told the detective that's when it happened. When gently pressed on what she meant by this, the survivor began to cry, explaining that he had pushed her down on the bed and told her she wasn't going anywhere. She thought he was joking, but told him he was over the line and he was just getting more and more physical with her. As the survivor explained that she tried to escape, pushing him, kicking him, punching him, she did anything and everything she could, but he was doing everything back 10 times harder to her. She was beaten and she was strangled and she said that her resistance was setting him off and he was forcefully removing her clothes and then he essayed her three times that first night. For the next three days, the survivor said that she was placed in weird positions as the man bound her and once he told her if she attempted to get out of that position, the binds would actually strangle her to death. She was sexually assaulted repeatedly in every way imaginable. She whimpered to the detective that she was too trusting, and she said that the second night she had been essayed four more times, and he would often record this on his cell phone. He began to tell the survivor that she needed to enjoy it, but she said she didn't enjoy it. It was wrong. She was then bound to the bed with women's clothing and this man started to apply makeup to her body and her face. He then placed sheets over most of her body, leaving out her shoulders and her face and began to photograph her. When she wouldn't follow his orders, especially sexually, he would choke her or hit her over the head and she began to beg him to let her die. But he would say he wasn't through with her yet. But at the same time, he would threaten that she better find a way out of there or he was going to kill her. 
She said that her abductor would sleep next to her in order for her to not be able to escape, though the binds were keeping her in the bed regardless. He also set an alarm on his phone for every five minutes so he wouldn't fall into a deep sleep. But on the morning of the 13th, the survivor had woken up and found that he was sleeping next to her. He hadn't slept in days, so he was exhausted, and she began to untie herself as she prayed. When she freed herself, she located the abductor's cell phone and called 911 from across the room. She said that while she was on the phone, whispering to dispatch, hoping that she wasn't going to wake him up, she accidentally set off a taser that was in the room. She said that her abductor sat up, he placed his feet on the floor, but he was groggy for a moment and just sat there before lying back down. Thankfully, he went back to sleep long enough for the survivor to get the police to her location. She said that when she heard those officers outside, she became braver and she could actually escape that room and the house. At this point, the detective major wanted this survivor to be evaluated by the medical facility because she had gone straight to the police department. She had not yet actually had those tests done to her. That would come later. But that's when the survivor burst into tears about the fear that she was pregnant. But the Ashland Police Department captain, he began to realize that he knew this survivor's name. They were calling her Jane Doe. They knew it because it had been seen in a missing persons report that had recently been reported to their department. In fact, just six days before the survivor was found and rescued on September 17th, a local 29-year-old woman named Elizabeth Griffiths had been reported missing as an endangered person. She hadn't been seen in weeks. Her therapist had been the one to report her missing after she missed several sessions with no contact. Now, Elizabeth, she suffered from paranoid schizophrenia and mania and was often in contact with the police. She had been telling her therapist that she was hoping God would get the evil out of her life. She was very religious as well. And the Ashland Police Department knew of Elizabeth long before she was reported missing because she would call 911 all the time due to her mania. She was like the apartment watchman and was up on all of the latest criminal activity as well. But when Ashland police began investigating her disappearance, they found a woman named Tamara that Elizabeth was going to this new church group with. It was called Hebrew Roots. It didn't actually have a church building. and Instead, they met at the rabbi's Home. So Tamara said that she had given Elizabeth a ride to the church multiple times and that one day Elizabeth had actually brought a friend with her. This friend was the survivor that the Ashland Police Department had just rescued. So Detective Major was tasked with asking the survivor about Elizabeth and if she knew what happened to this missing woman. But Detective Major didn't have to bring it up because like I said, the first thing the survivor said was Elizabeth's been missing for two weeks. When she was asked if she was talking about Elizabeth Griffiths, she said yes. She said that Elizabeth had lived in the apartment across from hers and that no one had seen her in weeks prior to when the survivor herself had been abducted. When asked if the abductor knew Elizabeth, the survivor said she didn't think they actually knew each other very well, but she and her abductor, Sean, would play badminton in the lawn of their apartment. And one day Elizabeth did come out, was talking to them. And the survivor said that Elizabeth was kind of telling Sean all of her problems. And so the survivor told her to stop and Elizabeth left. You see, the survivor would say that Elizabeth was very sweet, but she was like a child due to her mental problems and she often had very poor judgment. In fact, the survivor was always telling Elizabeth to be careful that she was going to make herself a victim. Then the survivor said she vanished about a month prior to her being abducted. She was asked if Sean ever told her about anything he had done to other women and the survivor said he never said anything specific, but he did make remarks that led her to believe that he had other victims. He actually told her that some of the scars on his body were from altercations with women who were mental. Now the survivor and Elizabeth's friend Tamara would be questioned by the police again and she claimed that before the survivor vanished, she had seen the survivor with Sean. So her friend Elizabeth was already missing. And then she had been the one to see Sean and the survivor at the Dollar Tree and gave them a ride back to the survivor's home. They were discussing Elizabeth's disappearance in front of Sean and Tamara said that Sean sat very silent the entire time 
before they switched the conversation to the fact that Tamara was building a garden shed in her yard. Sean was very excited. He was saying that he would help her with it, but when she asked him for his phone number, he said he didn't know it and he didn't have his phone on him. Now, this was strange because as they pulled up in front of the survivor's apartment, Sean jumped out without another word and began walking away, and that's when his phone fell out of his pocket, the one he said he didn't have on him. Tamara noticed this, but the survivor got out and she decided to leave at that point. And that was the last time she had seen the survivor or Sean until the survivor was rescued. So as the survivor was taken in for medical treatment, Detective Major entered the interrogation room with the man who had been arrested as the abductor. This was Sean Great. He had been interviewed by the captain, but Sean had become frustrated with the captain and shut down to all of his questions. Yeah, we ended up having sex. Against her will. Well, it ended up she didn't like it and she was really beating herself up about it. The sex part. Mm -hmm. so. It looks like you might have hit her a couple times. I did, because I lost control. Um, a lot of it that she'd marry me, marry me, and she won't marry me, you know, it's like, this is it. Mm -hmm. A lot of leading, you know. Mm -hmm. She may not have wanted to have sex, like, afterwards. After what? After I hit her. I did tie her down and abducted her. You abducted her? Yes. I just grabbed her, like... Where'd you grab her? Under her head. And then what? I forced her. Now it was this female detective's turn. They wondered if because this man had a female victim that this would in any way help with the interrogation. This detective was also just an incredible detective and so she was going in there as a professional. And the captain asked her to find out if he knew about the other missing girls. Not only Elizabeth Griffiths, but also a woman who had vanished a week prior to his arrest. So Elizabeth vanished a month prior. This was another woman who had vanished a week prior to his arrest. In the area, this was 43-year-old Stacy Stanley Hicks. She had come to Ashland for a manicure appointment on September 8th, and she never returned home. This was three days prior to when the survivor was taken captive. Now, a little bit about Stacy's disappearance was that she had called her adult son about 8.30 the night of September 8th, saying that she had a flat tire, she was panicking, she didn't know what to do. He had sent a family friend to go and help her, but when he called Stacy back to let her know, Stacy was calm. She said that she had a friend there who was helping her change the tire. The family friend still went to help and got there about 9 p.m. to see a male working on the tire. The family friend helped, they put the spare on, and then the family friend left, saying that the man was still there at that time. He was described as six feet slender, clean shaven, dressed in a striped shirt with cut off sleeves and baggy shorts. Stacy didn't appear to be afraid of this man in any way. And Stacy's son called her back to make sure she was okay around 10.15 and she said she was fine. The tire had been fixed. She was going into the gas station for a coffee and then she was going home. But her family reported her missing in her hometown after realizing she never made it home. And then their police department reached out to Ashland PD on September 11th because that is where she vanished from. The same day that survivor was taken and the same week that Elizabeth Griffiths had been reported missing as well. So Ashland police went to the gas station to investigate and they talked to the gas station clerk who was there that night. He said around 10 p.m. Stacy had come in and she had brought the man who had helped with her tire. She had bought him a coffee. They left together. She was chipper and nothing seemed off. But five blocks away from the gas station, her vehicle was found. The keys were still in the ignition. Her ID was still inside and the driver's seat was pushed so far back that it couldn't have been Stacy who was driving as she was short. So Detective Major was tasked with not only getting a confession to the kidnapping and the essay of the survivor, but also a confession of the whereabouts of these two missing women if he had something to do with it. So in her book, she spoke about how the first thing she did was to go into that room and take the handcuffs off of Sean. She wanted to make him more comfortable to talk to her and also the fact that a lot of people communicated through body language. So she wanted him to have full reign of his hands. So Sean Great was found to have a long criminal record dating back to when he was 17. He was a serial arsonist. He started fires as a child. And he would tell the detectives that as a young boy, he actually attacked one of his mom's boyfriends because he simply did not want him to be there. His mother would often tell him that 
she hoped that he would not become a pervert like her father and her grandfather who she alleged molested her. He said he had an obsession with decomposition and the flies that would come because of it. And he also said that he had been abandoned by his mother at 11 years old and he was sent to live with his father for the next four years. He was said to be a very depressed kid. Now his mother tried to come back into his life when he was about 17 and so he would often visit her home, but eventually he wanted nothing to do with her. He was still in high school actually when he became a father for the first time but the baby's mother ended up moving on and marrying a stand-up guy and took their daughter with her so he didn't have much to do with her and he was actually arrested for grabbing his girlfriend's throat at this point at 19 he broke into a home and was sentenced to four years in prison released in 1997 two years later he was arrested for breaking into the home of his new girlfriend lisa ball and when he was 23 he had a son with lisa ball and she would say that he also pulled a knife on her and threatened to kill her he called himself a great deceiver who lied to everyone in 2003, he was out of prison once again. He moved in with his older sister, but they believed he actually stole from them as well, so they kicked him out. He then went to live with his grandparents after that and kind of moved on into his own life, his own home, even though he rarely had an actual home. So he was on his own until 2010 when he was charged with first degree domestic violence against another girlfriend. He was given 180 days in jail and he went on to live with his mother again. Most of Sean Great's interrogation was about his childhood and his mother. They were rants that he was traumatized, that he was abandoned, that he had this horrible childhood. But he also threw in this story of when he was with his mother at one point after he had moved back in with her, that a, a woman had come up to the door to sell magazines and his mother had bought these magazines. She was waiting for them to come. They weren't coming. She was basically getting very frustrated and taking it out on Sean. And Sean said she never ended up getting those magazines. This was seemingly unimportant to the story, at least at this point in the investigation. His third child was with a woman named Amber Brown, whom he married. Amber would find out that Sean was cheating on her shortly after she gave birth, and when she confronted him, he just left. And Amber said that after that, he started to send her threatening messages and stalked her. He basically said he was going to put all of her family members' names in a hat and start taking them out one by one. He said if he couldn't see their daughter, no one could. So he had fathered three babies with three different women at this point. But with his arrest and charges of kidnapping and rape of this survivor, Sean told Detective Major that he and this survivor were friends. They were talking about marriage and he did one little thing that was bad, but they had a good relationship. So it was up to her now if she wanted to continue to pursue it. He said he lost control and he asked if the survivor was okay. He said they did have sex and he thought it was mutual until she started flipping out. Detective Major asked him if he wanted to say something to this survivor and what he would tell her if he could. And he said that he would tell her that she is hanging in there, she's doing a really good job and to not ever change. He was then asked if he would tell her that he was sorry and he said, oh yeah. Detective Major tried to take a very empathetic approach and she could see that he was hurting. And so she was asking about this and he interrupted her saying, I could be hurting more, but I'm just trying to stay strong. I think she knows I'm sorry. He began to say that this survivor wanted to marry him at first, but she then realized it was just lust. And so she no longer wanted to be with him. That they had talked about letting her go during that three days of captivity, that they would walk into the police station together. He would turn himself in. And Detective Major told Sean that he should let the survivor know what he did was wrong and that it's not her fault. And he then stated, it's not her fault, but she needs it though. That's the sad thing. Both of us needed to get through our lustful desires. While Sean had this survivor tied up in this house of horrors, he had then stolen her house keys, gone to her apartment, which he had never been allowed in before. And he went inside and stole $4 to spend on cigarettes and soda and to look around. But Sean also blamed the city of Ashland for due to the homeless shelter being shut down and there was nowhere to live. Detective Major just let him talk and then he grinned and said, I'm just joking. 
He said that he was actually on the run from a child support warrant, and he said that he either stayed in makeshift forts or abandoned homes. But within the first hour of interrogation, Sean Great did confess to abducting the survivor and raping her. But he also said, I don't regret it. Let's get this shit on the road. It doesn't matter to me. I died a long time ago on the cross. I died on the cross with Jesus. This is when Detective Major began to ask Sean about the other missing girls. And she told him that Elizabeth was still missing and that they couldn't find her. And Sean immediately refused to look at her. But finally, after denying everything, he asked, how do you know she's not okay? When the detective told him that's just what she believed, he said, maybe she's better off though. He believed that the detective was lying to him, that they had found Elizabeth and they were trying to find who had done whatever had been done to her. The detective ensured him that's not true. We need to find her body. And he said, I might not be able to take you to her, maybe someone else. And then he just trailed off not finishing his sentence. He refused to confess to Elizabeth that he was involved or show where her body was. So they weren't sure if he was involved with her disappearance at all or if he had any other victims. But then he told Detective Major that he could take her to another girl instead in Mansfield. He said that's how he got the scars on his head. When asked what happened to this woman, he said she's been gone, no hope. Sean actually began crying at this point, explaining that he loved this woman, but he could not stand her because she lied all the time. But this wasn't Elizabeth Griffith or Stacy Hicks, the two women that the police knew about that were missing. No, Sean Great would tell them about another woman. He would say that this was at a home that had been burned down. He had burned it down. And behind the house is the body of the 29-year-old woman named Candace Cunningham. In 2013, Candace moved to Mansfield and told her family she had finally met the right guy. But Sean confessed to killing Candace about three months prior to his arrest. He said that they had a toxic relationship and she was always attacking him and he just snapped and strangled her. And then he set the home on fire due to there being so much blood on the drywall. At this point, there was a confession of kidnapping and rape and a confession of murder. And this is when the flood of confessions began. Sean Great would finally say that detectives needed to search the house where he had been arrested. He confirmed that somebody was there. When asked who, he admitted that it was Elizabeth Griffith, the woman who had been missing for a month. She was upstairs in the closet. I'm looking for Elizabeth's body. She's dead? I believe she is. This is your moment. Is it my moment? Yeah? Is somebody in there? Yeah. Who is it? Is it Elizabeth? Where is she in there? In the closet. In the closet? Sean cried as he confessed that he had asked her to come over. She started bad-mouthing the survivor who was a friend of hers. And then Elizabeth started crying and saying she wanted to die. And he said that he freed her. He strangled her as she cried out to Jesus to save her. And Sean began to motion with his hands exactly how he strangled her to death. Like to Elizabeth, right? It was kind of shocking, right? I was just joking. We were just joking, like, how she wished she kind of would die, you know what I mean? It was like, so, so I'm, I'm healthy. I just feel like this, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. pushing uh, forward and yeah. up at the same time. Right. And she kind of just, like, Whack my hands and like started flipping out and stuff like that to the point where I had to just like grab her and I just would lean forward and just press. But when investigators received the search warrant for the home, they realized that there was not an upstairs closet until they began to dig through clothes and bedding in the corner of this bedroom and found a wooden door sealed with duct tape. The awful smell hit them as they opened the door and Elizabeth Griffith's body was found. She was badly decomposed, and it was found that Sean had also gone to Elizabeth's home to get rid of any evidence there after killing her. Now, two bodies have been found connected to Sean Great and one survivor, but that would not complete this monster's story. Because as the search proceeded at this residence, Detective Major was still talking to Sean and interrogating him, and Sean would say, there's another one down in the basement. As investigators who were already in the home headed downstairs, Sean confessed that this victim's name was Stacy. He couldn't remember her last name, 
But this was Stacy Hicks, the woman who had been missing for a week. Are there any other girls in the house right now? Yeah. What's her name? Stacy. Brought these women into my life somehow or another for a reason. And, but I think I'm learning that it wasn't really God, it was the devil. He said he had come across Stacy when he saw her standing outside of her car due to the flat tire. He said it was raining, so he was going to give her his umbrella. But as he went by, he asked if she needed help. She said someone was coming. So he went to the gas station. And then on his way back, he actually asked if she wanted to hang out. Sean said that Stacy said sure. And so they wanted to hang out that evening. So when the tire was finally fixed, Sean said he took her back to his place. He said it was good. They started kissing and then it went bad. And he snapped and began to think that she didn't even know him and she came home with him and that she was sent from God or the devil that someone had given up on her. At this point, he was very much victim blaming Stacy. And when Detective Major asked if he had strangled Stacy too, he responded with tongue out of her mouth. He said that when you choke a woman, they die with the tongue out of their mouth. He said he placed her body in the basement under the garbage and that's exactly where she was found and her tattoo on her hand identified her. Sean stated that his rage, his violence started when the lies started with somebody, that he had been lied to by women and so he would start to think that the woman he was with was a bullshitter. He said that Stacy reminded him of other women who had broken his heart and flashbacks to his mom. But interestingly enough, when the news of Sean Great being a serial killer broke, Sean's mother actually went to the tabloids and she said, yes, he's good looking, but the devil is good looking too. She would tell the media outlet that her son compared to Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer. She said, shocking because I love him and I know he loves me too but this love is a twisted love. Now, one of Sean's ex-girlfriends who had survived him, her name was Christina, and she had gone on the news to tell her story. And she said that she and Sean had been together for five years, that he was charming, but that could quickly turn into wickedness in a nanosecond. That he would get angry over things that most people would just let slide. He isolated her from her family and friends, and he strangled her on several occasions. He would always apologize after saying he would never do it again. One night, Christina came home from work and the house had been cleaned after she had been working all day. And he said that she should pay him for doing so. She refused and he gave her a black eye and a broken hand. At the hospital, she would tell the staff what he had done. And as the police arrived, he ran. When she returned home, Sean was waiting for her inside and beat her. This happened several times before he went on the run. Finally, he was sentenced for 30 days in jail for domestic violence, which was extended to six months. So was he violent with you? Yes. In, in what way? Um, he broke my hand, blacked my eye, strangled me, tied me up. She said that Sean told her when he was about 11 or 12, he told his mother there was something really wrong with him, but she just told him to pray about it. Christina told the police that she had found IDs belonging to other women when she lived with him, but they started dating around 2007, way before his abductions and his murders, right? Because at this point, all they knew about were abductions and murders that happened in 2016. Well, on September 15th of 2016, Sean Great was charged with kidnapping and the rape of the survivor and the murders of Elizabeth and Stacy. When he was asked if he had anything else to get off his chest, he told Detective Major that there was a cold case and that the body had already been found. Do you remember the Jane Doe we spoke about that in 2007 in Marion County, Ohio was found and had yet to be identified? Well, this woman had been going door to door to sell magazines to make money and investigators knew this because Sean Great had mentioned that years prior to being caught, a woman had gone to his mother's home selling magazines, but she never returned. Sean Great had hinted that he had killed this woman and now he was confessing to killing this Jane Doe 
He believed her name was Dana, but he didn't know much. This happened in his hometown, and he said he felt like he had to do it. He said that his mother was complaining about these magazines, so he went and found the woman, brought her to his grandparents' house that was abandoned, and then he strangled her. And then he panicked and stabbed her in the neck. During the interrogation, he would say this was the first time, as in the first time he killed. He said he had seen that her body was found a few years later, but she wasn't identified, so he proceeded to demonstrate how he strangled her on Detective Evans, a fellow detective. He would tell Detective Major that someday in my life, I'm gonna be free from all of this, free from what I've done. There's a purpose for why I'm moving on to an institution. That is when he confirmed that he had given them all of his victims. He had killed four people. But Detective Major didn't believe this. In her book, she would reveal that it was actually her adult son who was working on becoming a police officer himself who had informed her that a woman had been found around the area where Sean had said he had made his forts and she had been deemed an overdose victim but he began to believe that Sean had killed her too. She had been found a year prior to his arrest in 2015. So Detective Major then pushed Sean about another possible murder and Sean Gray would state her name loud and clear without having to be prompted. He said he had a problem with her once and she got violent with him. He said that she tried to rob him and that's when he stated that she was number two on his kill list and confessed to the murder of a woman who stole $4 from him. He had dumped her in Mansfield, Ohio, but Sean didn't have to lead investigators back to her body because she had already been found. This was Rebecca Lacey, whose death was determined to be an overdose, but she was actually strangled to death. He then apologized to Detective Major, saying that he felt like a liar for not telling her about this victim. But he believed he set Rebecca free by killing her. So he had killed Dana, the Jane Doe first, and then Rebecca, and then Candace, and then Elizabeth, and then Stacy, and then abducted the survivor. But he had a 10 year gap between the first two murders. And when asked why, he said a lot of regret, but that he had been having homicidal thoughts 10 years prior to killing Dana, his first victim. Five murders, one kidnapping, but there was something that Sean didn't confess. And that was why the survivor was adamant that she had heard thumps in the home that she was held captive in during the time she was there. She said it happened the first day and the second day. It was like a human who was pounding. And the third day, Sean actually left the home. And when he did, the poundings never happened again. Even though Elizabeth and Stacy, who were found deceased in this home and the other victims who were found deceased elsewhere long before her abduction couldn't have been alive during this time. Was this another victim that he was holding captive? Was she still alive? When Sean's phone was searched, there was actually videos of him assaulting the survivor as well as Stacy. But there was another video of an unknown brunette woman. She was just sitting there as he pleasured himself. Was she a victim? Was she alive? They didn't know. But they did know that there was another survivor and perhaps many more. Several weeks after the arrest, a woman named Tracy said that she had actually met Sean and gone to his home. He was asking her all sorts of questions about her life and then he offered her a massage. She agreed to this, but he began to act strangely and so she kind of looked at him and saw that his eyes looked weird like he was mad. So she told him she needed to leave and she ran out the door. This was actually not the brunette girl in the video either. So Sean was asked about this brunette and he said he didn't mess around with her, that she just liked to look at him when he was nude, but that she was alive. And the investigators actually confirmed this. Throughout the many interviews that Sean had with Detective Major, he told her about his victims. He said, there have been five before pausing and then stating, women. Detectives began to believe that he might have other victims who were either men or children. But while Detective Major seemed to gain the serial killer's trust, she was shown how dangerous this man could be because she was informed by another inmate that Sean Great had planned to make her his sixth victim. 
that killing the female detective who was interviewing him would be the ultimate crime, so he was trying to get close enough to her to get her gun. At this point, in jail, he was already in solitary confinement for bad behavior, and he wanted to kill the prison guards. He said that while thinking about it, because he never really had a motive, that was something he was always pondering and asking people about, and he said that he had discovered he didn't really feel a hunger to kill with the first four victims, but with Stacy, it was different. He had that hunger and he was feeling it at that point too with the officers and the cellmate he wanted to kill. Detective Major wanted to continue the interviews with him. Her captain told her that he was afraid that this man was going to make her a victim. And so the communication between the two was shut down, even as Sean was sending her messages, threatening her that he would never speak to her again if she didn't come to him. And he was also saying he had information about another victim. Still, she was not allowed to intervene as the case was now in the FBI's hands. In 2017 in Ashland, Sean Great was being charged with two counts of aggravated murder, kidnapping, and sexual assault. He entered a not guilty plea by reason of insanity and the prosecution was aiming for the death penalty. In Richland County, he had been charged for the murder of Candace Cunningham and Rebecca Lacey. And then in Marion County, he was charged with the death of Dana, the Jane Doe, still without her name. At this point, Sean actually was communicating with the media and he wrote a note saying that his motives had to do with government assistance and that government assistance took these victims' minds. He said they were already dead, just their bodies were flopping wherever it can flop, but their minds were already dead. The state took their minds once they started receiving their monthly checks. After this, a gag order was placed so he could no longer talk to the media. He was given a competency hearing, which he passed, and an assessment found him sane at the time of the crime. The defense then had to withdraw the guilty plea by reason of insanity. So the trial for the crimes in Ashland began on April 23rd of 2018 and Sean pleaded guilty. The prosecutor, Chris Tunnel, said this isn't a whodunit case. This is a he did it case. The dispatcher who took the call from the survivor testified the call had come in about 10 minutes prior to her dispatching shift ending and the audio was played for the courtroom. Sergeant Jim Cox of the Ashland PD testified he was one of the first officers on the scene and that he instructed the survivor to go wait in the bathroom of the home while they went to arrest this man and that if anything went wrong, she should run. She was in the nude after all. And so once Sean was arrested, the survivor then went and grabbed some clothes to be taken to the police department. The survivor then bravely took the stand and Sean Great did not look away for one moment when she was there, but she refused to look at him. She was emotional at first, but seemed to gain composure to tell her story. How often would you see one another? two, maybe three times a week. During that period of time when you were playing tennis or, or taking your walks with, uh, with Sean, what was his demeanor generally? Um, he was very uh, courteous, usually. Um, sometimes he would get um, like immature, just, I don't know. Immature? Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. How would he be getting uh, immature, would you say? I don't know, maybe make, making stupid jokes or something. What, what made you not want to go into his apartment? I just don't like to be alone with the opposite sex. Would you describe it as a frenzy like that he was in when he was attacking you and assaulting you? A calm frenzy at times, but yes, a frenzy, I would, if I understand you correct. It was out of the ordinary for him based on what you knew of him. It was out of the ordinary. The second night that you were there, you described that you were in bed with Sean and uh, you were sleeping next to him. And I think you said that you were against the wall. Yes, he always had me against the wall. All right, in the bed. Yes. And he's next to you. Right. Okay. And this is when you were able to crawl over top of him. Is that how you got out of the bed? Uh, that's, I had to reach over him to try to find the phone, but I picked up the uh, taser. I had to, um, I crawled down the length of the bed to okay. get off the bed. I didn't well, You didn't over crawl him. over top of him. You had to move alongside of him down to the end of Correct. the bed. Correct. Then you were out of the bed. Right. And then you made the call for 911. Yes. Okay. I think he said he felt led by God to come to Ashland and he was led to that house. I think that happened during that time. 
Now, Detective Kim Major then took the stand, and this was the first time Sean was said to show any emotion. He placed his head in his hands, and he started crying. The courtroom then heard her interrogations with this alleged serial killer. But eight days into this trial, Sean pleaded guilty to 15 charges, including the rape of Stacy, kidnapping and sexual motivation of the survivor, and burglary and tampering with evidence and gross abuse of a corpse. He was given 50 years for this, though he did not mention the murders. So the jury found Sean guilty of the remaining charges of the aggravated murder of Elizabeth and Stacy and the three counts of kidnapping. Uh, my name is Curtis Stanley. I'm Stacy's son. You know, I've been waiting a long time to see you, man. All the stuff you said about her, the note you wrote me, you know, I was kind of upset. You know, you wrote me a note and lied about the whole thing. I sat here and watched everything you've done, you know, and you asked for forgiveness, and I tell myself, hey, I, I can't even do it, and I can't even lie about it. You know, I can't forgive you for, uh, you know, what you said about her. She's not that kind of person. As you can see, man, I got a a bunch of people out here, a bunch of people sitting outside of these rooms that all loved her, man. You took my mom, my daughter's grandmother, all that stuff. And, you know, I can't get that back. And for you to say the stuff she did, man, she wasn't like that. She helped, she gave you a ride home that night. You know, she didn't need your help. She had a bunch of family. She, there's a guy there because people care about her. She was that kind of person when you went around her. She helped you. You know, you took that. You know, I had to live with it every night. Same thing. You know, you gotta, you made it out easy in my eyes. It's pathetic. Because we were on your ass looking for you and everything else for my mom. You know, to make sure she was okay. And I know you knew. And I knew you knew who I was when I walked in here the first day. I'm not gonna give up on her. You deserve what you get, you know, and every bit of it, and what comes to you inside that place. But that ain't gonna bring the fact that she's not here, you know? I'm never gonna get that back. You know what hurts me most is my daughter's not gonna get to know her. I did, and so did these guys. You know, she's in a better place, but you deserve to take her for the reason you took her and the things you did to her. And then what's pathetic is I came to see you at the jail, you didn't have enough balls to come in the room to see me, to talk to me eye to eye. You don't scare me, you don't scare any of these guys here. You did wrong. And that doesn't make you a man because you killed these women. Those women deserve to live. You didn't have the right to choose when they were gonna go. And I just want you to know, and everybody else here does too, that she had family that cared. And so does those other people did. And you know, you didn't just hurt her, you hurt everybody else in that process too. You, you live with the punishment, but you don't live with the hurt. You can say you hurt, but man, you, you killed five women, you don't hurt for that. That's evil. You killed a wrong woman. That was a great woman you killed. That doesn't affect just one person when you kill them. That affects everybody. You ever bury your mother? I had to pick a casket out. I didn't expect that this young. I had to go in there and pick a casket out. And you made it to where I couldn't even have an open casket to say goodbye to her. During the sentencing phase, Dr. John Fabian, a forensic and clinical psychologist, testified that Sean had been given an evaluation by him and that he had a number of complicated mental health issues. He had persistent depressive disorder, bipolar, borderline intellectual functioning, ADHD, personality disorder with antisocial, schizoid, borderline, narcissistic traits. He has been around 25 hours with Sean, gave him 25 tests, and he determined that he was essentially lacking that attachment to his family and had a disdain towards his mother. When children are found to have a lack of attachment, this is often diagnosed as reactive attachment disorder. He said that Sean's brain was hardwired differently and if a car has four wheels, Sean only had three. And while the defense claimed that the death penalty was going to be just another murder, the jury determined that he should be sentenced to death for the murders. Yeah, today's a good day, mainly for all of you guys and myself. You know, hope we could just move on from all this. You know, I don't know exactly, you know, I can't say I'm normal, but, you know, I know right from wrong, mainly, just the, if I cause any hate, bitterness, and then all of any of you, you can work on that. And I ask you maybe forgive me, find your heart someday, I know not today, but someday. Just move on from this life and may justice be served today. That's most important. Elizabeth, Stacy, and Lori. 
thank you for all your time and this mess. I'm sorry for all human beings that have to live here lives. Okay. I'm sorry. I can't can't change nothing. Believe me, I would. Not for me, but for you guys. Thank you. On March 1st of 2019, he pled guilty to the murders of Rebecca and Candace. He was sentenced to life without parole for Rebecca and 17 years for the other charges. But he already had his death sentence in Ashland County. He wasn't getting out anytime soon. But in June of 2019, the Marion County, Ohio, Jane Doe was identified. And Sean was telling the truth. Her name was Dana, Dana Nicole Lowry. She had been identified through the DNA Doe Project, and she was 23 years old at the time of her murder and had two daughters who were four and one years old. So on September 11th of 2019, he pleaded guilty for the murder of Dana and was sentenced to life without parole, plus 20 years. Now, Sean Great appealed his death penalty, asking for a new trial, but this was rejected and his execution is actually scheduled for March 19th of 2025. The mayor of Ashland then announced that the House of Horrors was going to be demolished. Do you believe there are more victims out there? Did he leave hints about those other victims just like he did with Dana and Rebecca before confessing to those as well? I think it's quite telling that this man paused after saying there were only five victims who were women. I hope you learned a little something different about this case. I know that this female detective's perspective on the entire thing was so intriguing to me. So I'll leave her book down below. She goes into much more about why she does certain things, about her own personal life and how it affected that, if she was scared and all of those different things. It's a, it's a great read and she is a great detective who really knew what she was doing and how to get into the mind of a serial killer. And so I highly recommend the book and I hope that you learned a little something different about this case even if you have previously heard of it. So don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces.